hello to those of you that watch us online. This is Pastor Chris Green and my wife Carol and the Urban Life Church. All we're, we're all here about to uh, dive into the Word. This year the Lord uh, has had us talking about knowing Him. And, and this kind of carried over from 2011, when, as you guys remember, we were talking about being assured and secured in our relationship with the Lord. And the reason why we got into that subject was because it, I felt like it was very important for us to be able to deal with the circumstances in our life, to deal with the trials, to deal with stuff that was going on. Uh, you got to know that your relationship with God is tight. You got to know that God's not fluctuating and going back and forth on you because most of us have been taught that when you're good, God loves you. He's with you, and when you're bad, you're kicked out of the family, God, and you got to start all over again. And even if they never, ever use those words, that is the culture of many homes and many churches. Um, we have what I call Santa Claus mentality. You know, we put the Santa Claus song on God. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. And so the same way it is with Santa Claus, we are the same way with God. You better watch out. You better watch out. And so that's not just a Santa Claus thing. Many people feel that way about God, and it's even taught that way. And so we've been taking the time to really go through the Word of God and show us uh, how secure we are so we can be sure in our in our relationship with the Lord so that as we are going through stuff in life we are able to navigate it and go through it because the Lord was leading us by his peace I told you that uh, that the word of the Lord really does say that he leads us by his peace and that peace is not just a warm cuddly soft feeling no, he leads us by the same peace or the assurance or the witness that was given to us when we were saved. When you gave your heart to the Lord, there's an assurance that he put within you, a witness, the, Bible, the word the Bible uses, that he places within you and I that we are his. And he leads us with that same assurance in everyday life. The same peace that you have that you're saved is the same peace that he uses when you got to make decisions. Where am I going to live? Where am I going to work? What am I supposed to do now that this has happened, that that has happened? And if you're never sure about your relationship with God, then it's very difficult to navigate through life because you're always wondering, is God really going to be there with me or am I on my own? And many of us feel like we're on our own because of what we've been taught. Because we've been taught that when I mess up, when I don't make the right decisions, you better watch out. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Lord. Let's just pray this prayer like we always do. I won't be before you very long. And today is just more of a review of the things that we've talked about. And uh, feel free to take some notes. And, uh, because it's going to be important what I share with you today and continue next Sunday. Uh, about our assurance in, in the Lord. Let's just say this together. Lord, I pray that the word today would find good soil in my heart. I reject the thoughts of offense where the light of your word exposes my mistakes. I do not take offense. I will change and turn to you, my heavenly father. I reject condemnation. Your word says that Jesus did not come to condemn people. This word does not come to condemn me but it comes to heal me. I reject accusation. Satan is the accuser of brothers and sisters, and this word does not come to accuse me or abuse me. This word exposes Satan and his lies, and I choose to believe and receive the truth. God says in his word, blessed are my eyes for they see, and my ears for they hear. For many prophets and righteous men desire to see what I see, and did not see it, and to hear what I hear, and did not hear it. Therefore, I will hide your word in my heart, that I might not sin against or miss the will of God. Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your word today. Lord, I thank you for this word and what you have 
really place in our hearts to give to your people so that we can walk in assurance with you. I decrease in this room right now that you would increase. I receive right now your anointing to impart and give to your people only what you want them to have. May this not be any, have anything to do with Chris Green, his experiences, his failures or his flaws, preferences or any of that. But Lord, let it be purely your word and what we must have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We asked three questions. You guys probably remember this. We asked question number one, how do I know that I'm saved? And we gave you the answer. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit assures us in our hearts that Christ is truly there and that we are new. And we asked the question, do you have the witness of the Holy Spirit that makes you sure? And we went through some witness scriptures, like we call them, or some assurance scripture. You'll know that you're saved because uh, the Bible says that this witness or assurance is given to those who have received him to those who are in Christ, to those who are joined to the Lord, to those who have repented or turned around and believed the gospel. Uh, this assurance or witness is given to those who have been born again. It's given to those who have confessed that Jesus is Lord. Uh, it's given to those who believe and receive him by faith. Um, we uh, gave you this other assurance scripture from 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And we took the time to just to explain a little bit about what it really means to have the new things and even the process that we are in. We talked from Philippians, the first chapter, the sixth verse, which says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Uh, we took the time to explain what it means to actually be saved because uh, before, we wanted, uh, before we wanted to get into how to live the saved life, <laughs> I think it's important that you know what, it, what actually happened to us to get saved. I mentioned to you that there have been two times, personal experience here in Harrisburg, I've heard pastors give what's called an altar call or an invitation for somebody to people to give their hearts to the Lord. The first time was almost 20 years ago when we were visiting here in Harrisburg and we attended, we visited a church and a pastor asked people to come forward who wanted to give their hearts to the Lord. And several people came up that day. I was really impressed by what I was looking at sitting in the audience. I'm visiting my wife's hometown and, and uh, someone's invited people to come up to give their hearts to the Lord. But then my hearts were crushed as he went to each person and said, you keep seeking. And went to the next person and said, you keep seeking. And he went to the next person and said, you keep seeking. And he didn't tell any one of them of how to give their hearts to the Lord. Well, later on in that service, they asked me to have some words to say because they, they knew that I was a visitor and so I got up there and yes I did. <laughs> I got up there and I told the people how to get saved. <laughs> For those of you who came up today, I did it, didn't I mom? I, I, I said, For those of you who came up today to give your hearts to the Lord, this is how you do it. You ask the Lord to come into your heart. You turn away from sin, turn away from your own way, open up your heart's door and invite him to come in. Because there is no way in the world I was going to walk out of that building where people then came up to get saved and they're told to go keep seeking. I'm like, they came to church because they're seeking. They came up because they're seeking. You don't turn them away and tell them to go keep seeking. This is my seeking. Here it is. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> the second time it happened was just a few months ago. And uh, we were attending a church, and again, the pastor, he was preaching. End of the sermon, he, he uh, said, bow your heads, close your eyes. Y'all know how they already said, bow your heads, close your eyes. And those of you who want to give your heart to the Lord, raise your hand. Well, I opened my eyes to see. I was looking to see who, who's got their hands raised. And y'all laughing, because you know you be peeking, too. Everybody be looking around. So I did too, because one of the things you want to find out is if anybody raised their hand, that's the other thing too. But actually there were several people that raised their hand. 
And then the man went on and proceeded to talk about, you need to live holy, you need to live safe, you know. And he started talking about all the stuff, about living holy and living right and all that stuff. And again, he did not tell them how to get saved. He started talking about the things that believers do. Believers do strive to live a pure and clean life before the Lord. We do try to treat people right. We do try to be, you know, generous. That, that's what believers do. But that's not what you do to get saved. Yeah. <laughs> so, I didn't have an opportunity that time to come behind that. <laughs> But that's been my experience here in Harrisburg, of encountering two different pastors, two different denominations, and neither one of them told people how to get saved. And so we have taken the time, since Urban Life Church has been started, to constantly tell people how to do whatever it is that we're, that we're telling you that needs to happen in your life. It doesn't do any good if I don't go the next step and say, here's how to do that. And for too long, that's been a part of Christianity, where we put up all these posters, you know, these poster child, you know, you know what I mean? I say poster child, these posters that represent things that we should be attaining. But there's never any instructions to say, how do I get there? How do I reach that? You keep putting these goals and lofty ideas in my head and without any steps to tell me how to do that, only thing you're doing is frustrating me. And that's why so many people give up because we haven't taken the time to say, here is what it means to be saved. Here is how you reach that. So we showed you this little chart of what the, shows what it actually means to be saved. Here, is, here was the dilemma. Man and God were separated. We were separated by sin by the first disobedience that happened between man and God, where man turned away from God and went his own way. So they created a separation. The word, the word, in fact, the word death actually means separated. Man and God were separated. So man was on the side of sin and death and judgment and lake of fire. That's, that was man's destiny. And on God's side, there's life, love, peace, purpose, and fulfillment. And so Man, in his own efforts, has done all kinds of things to try to uh, reach God, to reach life, to reach love, to reach peace, to reach purpose, to reach fulfillment. And we do things like trying to be charitable. Uh, people even try to pray. They even go to church. They even get baptized with water. There's all kinds of nice, good things that people do. Sort of like what that pastor did. He started telling people all those good things that you should be doing. But that's not what bridges the gap <laughs> between man and God. Good works don't, doesn't do it. Uh, only Christ bridges the gap. When he died on the cross, he paid the price. What do I mean by the price? The Bible says the wages or the payment for sin is death. It's separation. But the gift of God is eternal life. Jesus came to bridge the gap. Unfortunately, though, many people still stay in this position. They still stay on the side of man's effort to try to get to God. They won't cross the bridge because today, as we all know, many people do not believe that Christ is the way. They believe that there are many ways to get to God. And that's what religion is. Religion is man's search or effort to reach God. But Jesus came to us. Jesus is about God's effort to reach man. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> it's all about him. And so you and I must make a decision to cross over and that decision is made when we repent so you, you may have heard that word repent many times maybe you've even seen people on the street holding big repent signs uh, on the corners holding repent signs so sometimes when you hear that word repent those pictures come to your mind that's not what i'm talking about <laughs> repent and it's it's there's nothing appealing in that approach of trying to scare the hell out of people. 
You hear what I'm saying? Because you can't scare people into God. You can't yell and fuss at people into God. When the Bible says repent, it literally means just change your mind. It means turn, about face, military turn. About face. That's what repent is. Turn from the way that you was going and go this way. If you just broke back, break down the word repent in its basic meaning, the word pent is top. Repent means return to the top. Return to God's best. You were going your own way, come back to the top. Isn't that great? Wow. <laughs> You'll never see repent ever again the same way. <laughs> Turn around and come. God's got the best for you. Wow. Isn't that great to know? Because he has love and peace and purpose and fulfillment. But you're going to have to turn and then believe him. Believe him. That's what causes us to cross that bridge. I've turned. I believe. And then I receive. What am I receiving? I'm receiving what was done on my behalf. What was done on my behalf. Literally, we were all born on death row. born on death row but what if on the day of your execution somebody comes in and steps in and takes your place and says no John no Bobby no no I'm gonna take the lethal injection I'll take it for you you're free to walk out that's what Jesus did for you ain't that fantastic Ain't that fantastic? That's what makes us appreciate what really happened at the cross. Because we were on death row. And he said to his father, I'll go and die in their place. Whew. That's what it means to get saved. When we receive him, what we're receiving is what he did in our place. Doesn't that change everything? Now you see why that message of telling somebody, keep seeking. Now you see why that's so crazy. What do you mean, keep seeking? Now you see why the message of telling somebody, well, you need to do all these great things. You need to do all these holy, special things in order to get saved. No, this is about what Christ did for us. And all I'm doing is repenting, believing, and receiving what he did for me. Ain't that good today? I can say to the Lord, thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you, Lord. That's the decision that you and I made. That's the decision that he's requiring of people in the world today. Now you see why it's such a devastating thing when a person doesn't give their heart to the Lord, when they don't receive what was done in their place. You remain on death row with him saying, all you got to do is receive what I did. All I got to do is receive what I did. Constantly. All I got to do is receive what I did. And there are people still trying to work for it. He said, you can't work for it because the penalty for sin is death. No amount of work will pay for it. The only price is death. So the only way you could pay is by dying. Not working. But yet people are trying to work to obtain something that can only come by death. Wow. Now I'll say again, Lord, I'm so glad that you saved me because I never could have earned it. Only death could earn it. My Lord God. Woo. Remember we talked about understanding salvation and how we talked about the different Phases was the word I use, but just three different ways of viewing salvation to understand it fully. We talked about salvation being, first of all, being delivered from the penalty of sin, which the Bible refers to as justification. We talked about salvation being being delivered from the power of sin, and that the Bible refers to as sanctification, and the Bible refers to being delivered from the presence of sin and that's called glorification. 
we showed you that, that being delivered from the penalty of sin is something that happened in the past. It has happened. When you receive the Lord Jesus as your Savior, then God sees that as that's over and done. You are now justified. I love my wife's definition. Just as if you never sinned. You've been made right before God. You've been placed into a position of being right before God. I'm delivered from the penalty of sin. Death is no longer over my life. Just say that to yourself. Death is no longer over my life. You just say that to yourself every day. Wake up in the morning. Death is no longer over my life. So what's happening to us now in the present? Present tense, we're being delivered from the power or the influence of sin. That's the word the Bible uses, the word sanctification. That's a process. Why is that a process? Because you and I were born into a fallen world. We were born into families where certain mindsets and things were taught to us. Certain addictions and family iniquities became a part of us. So when you gave your heart and your life to the Lord, you were delivered instantly from the penalty of sin. And now you're in the process of being delivered from sin's influence that has been in your life. Now there's the obvious stuff that everybody can think of that you're being delivered from, you know, like if you... If, if you had a family addiction with sexual addictions in your family and perversions, or if you had uh, alcohol or drug things that were happening in your family, uh, anger, <laughs> depression, all those kinds of things you struggle with in your family. Profanity can be a big part of some of your family, just part of your life. So you're just used to doing it. And so a, a person who then gave their heart to the Lord, he is, he's, penalties cut. Now they go to work the next day. They got one of the time at church. Let's just use that example. They gave their heart to the Lord at church this Sunday. God moved in their life. They cried. It was just one of everything. And so the Lord is in my life. Penalty solved. Now they get to work tomorrow. And that boss, all those coworkers, somebody said something. And so because for 25, 35, 40 years, profanity has been a part of their life, immediately they just... <laughs> And so there's the enemy right there saying, I thought you got saved. I thought you gave your heart. Well, you did. And the penalty of sin is no longer on my life. But now I must learn to live in this new life that has been birthed in me. I still got certain reactions that just, it's just knee jerk. It's just automatic. But whereas Friday when you left work and you did that and you didn't feel nothing about it, this time when you do it, there's the Holy Spirit saying, and you go, oh, I'm sorry, Lord, I didn't mean that. But before, there was no tug of war inside of you for saying us going off like that. You just did it. But now that that new life is in you, now you feel something when you do it. And you go, and you even get, sometimes you feel bad, very bad. And if you aren't taught correctly, you'll think you're not saved. You'll think you're no longer a Christian because you're still got to go through the process of sanctification. And that's where many churches have failed. They've told people when they slip back into old habits that they are again under the penalty of sin. But they don't become unjustified. What it is is they're still in the process of sanctification. So many people have been told that they're no longer saved because the power of sin or the influence of sin still has certain strongholds in their life. In the weeks to come, we're going to start talking about spirit-filled living because this is a major, major key for you to gain power and authority and ability over sin's power and influence in your life. Being filled with the Spirit of God. Yeah, we're headed that way. That's why I'm glad we're moving upstairs because we need some uninterrupted services. Because <laughs> we're going to start talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit and knowing how to pray in the Spirit, praying tongues and getting the authority and not the authority, the ability that comes from God to break those influences on our lives. 
I'm looking so forward to that. <laughs> and the curses and all that stuff. But you really do need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to even talk about what it means to be filled. What that actually means. The, the basic definition, it means to be under the controlling influence. The Bible uses that word filled, the Greek word, and it literally means to be under the controlling influence. That's why when the Bible says, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, everybody's been harping on, don't be drunk with wine, and there's the proof that you shouldn't be drinking. Well, actually what the writer was talking about, don't be under the influence of wine, be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Just like wine and alcohol, they're called controlled substances. And when you get filled with them, you may say or do anything. <laughs> it releases your inhibitions and you say stuff you normally wouldn't say and do stuff you normally wouldn't do because you're under its controlling influence. But he said be under the controlling influence of the Holy Spirit so that there's some stuff that you normally would say and normally would do. Now you're under his influence and his control. And you find that instead of it being so quick to say this or react to that or fall back into depression or speak negative things, because maybe in your family line, if somebody got the slightest little ache and pain, they, everybody would just start speaking stuff. Oh, my stomach hurt. Girl, boy, you might be cancer. So you come from a family that's always speaking out death, and you start doing it. Generational stuff. My mom always had that, my grandma always had it, her mother's mother always had that. So when you start getting the symptoms, you just automatically receive it and say it. Why? Because that's been the influence of sin in your family. But under, once you get filled with the Holy Spirit, he's able to help you check that. That's part of this sanctification process, to check that. Because it's just been a normal thing in our family. That's just how we always respond. We always, there are certain families, you can just think about it, there are certain families, you, everybody knows what that family is like. Generational iniquitous stuff. And so you take a young man who has been taught all his life that women are just to be conquered, it's conquest, that women ain't no good, they just out for your money. If he's been taught that, just because he gave his heart to the Lord, don't change his mindset. So it takes pastors like me to do. Don't do that. Holy Spirit's inside of you. Even before I say it, the Holy Spirit's right there saying, mm -mm, that's not you no more. That's how you used to be. But he's been in the habit of it for so long, that's just what comes to his mind first. It comes up first. And again, without the teaching and without the Holy Spirit being present in his life, then eventually he just falls back into the old habits. That's, I believe that has happened to hundreds, if not thousands or millions of people across this country. They really did give their heart to the Lord, but nobody ever told them the difference between justification and sanctification. That once you get saved, the Bible says, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We grow in this thing. Sometimes we expect people to come out running, and they've just been born. My children, I don't know, my children had to learn to walk. They had to learn to talk. They had to crawl. Yeah, they, you, children, you know, you can't even roll over on your own. Parents be all, all happy, like, oh, he rolled over on his own for the first time. <laughs> he lifted his head. Don't y'all remember? You'd be so happy at every little thing that they do. And just like a child, we are. Do you guys know, do you realize that we didn't come here knowing our parents? You can't even focus. You begin to recognize that voice and recognize that face. That's why after a child gets accustomed to their mama's face, and their daddy's face, they get scared at all other faces. Or they don't like those other faces. Because these are the only faces I know. This is the face I see every day. This is the voice I hear every day. But all I'm saying is we're the same with God. We must learn to recognize his voice. Just like a child, recognizing his voice, recognizing his face, recognizing his expressions. 
Those of you who've been walking in the things of God, you know what I mean when there's, where the Holy Spirit just kinds of has, he doesn't have, uh, doesn't speak words. It's just kind of a feeling that you get when you know you're out of line. Like when your parents look across the room at you. Remember those days if your parents could just look at you and you knew you were in trouble. They didn't say a word. They just looked. And we get that from the Holy Spirit. Out of our intimacy with him, it just comes to a point where it's like we can just feel him saying, that was good. Oh, we feel him saying, that's not, that's not what I want you to do. Thank you, Lord. And then ultimately, and I'll stop here today, we're looking forward to being delivered from the very presence of sin. And that's called glorification. And we're all looking forward to the day when we literally, can you imagine that? Not even being in the presence of sin. Being with the Lord in glory. Now, I'm not saying I'm ready to go to heaven yet because I got a job to finish. But it's still wonderful to know that we will be actually be delivered from the very presence of sin. No pain, no disease, no stress. Just start there. No stress. Just, just, no, just stay there. No stress. <laughs> No bills, no this. Delivered from the very presence of sin. No wrestling and tugging going on in my heart about responding to God. Just being in his presence. Thank you, Lord. Bless the Lord. So we just really wanted to emphasize that for you today about what it really means to be saved. So that as we are going to, in these next few weeks, talk about some of the consequences of sin because when you talk like I've been doing and uh, talk about uh, uh, the security and the assurance that we have in the Lord a lot of people get very nervous I'm not saying that that's you I know that some of my pastoral friends uh, who occasionally watch our videos they get a little bit nervous when they hear Pastor Chris talking like this about the assurance and God is there and he's not gonna leave us because they're thinking well aren't you giving people an excuse to sin and I'm not giving people an excuse to sin but we've got to have assurance about our relationship with the Lord. I've got to have assurance about my relationship with the Lord. Why? Because we're going through some stuff. All of us in this room. And I can't make it through the trials, the situations, if I don't have peace. And I won't have peace if I'm not sure of where I stand with God. Now that I understand that I'm free from the penalty of sin and I'm in the process of him perfecting me, now as situations and circumstances hit my life, I can constantly go to him from the perspective of, Lord, what are you seeking to do through me in this situation? What is it that you're perfecting in me in this circumstance? How are you using me to be a blessing and a help to somebody else? You know, sometimes we're going through stuff and it ain't about us at all. It ain't even about us. That the nurse, somebody say, it ain't about you. <laughs> it's not about you. <laughs> it's not about you. And for us to be the effective people that God wants us to be here in this city, it's, that's going to be very much a part of the word for us in the weeks, the months, and dare I say it, the years to come, that we recognize it's not about me. He's using me. He's working through me. God is speaking through me. But I want him to be able to speak through a clean vessel. I want people to get a clear message of God when they watch my life. Does that mean I get everything perfect? No, but it means that even when I mess up, I'll still be quick to confess I was wrong, apologize. Woo, aren't you glad to no longer have to be under the performance pressure? Religion creates a performance pressure. It's all this, always this pressure to make 100%, to make no mistakes. Did you know that God did not call us to strive for no mistakes? He called us to strive to chase after him, to press after him. My soul, the psalmist says, follows hard after you. And if I've got my heart and my mind set on just being perfect, 
Don't you know that the chase and the, the chase for perfection uh, is not necessarily a chasing after God? And many times in our religious beliefs and teachings, we thought that perfection is God. The chase for perfection is God. That's not God. He says, follow me, not perfection. Even where the word of the Lord says, be ye perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. Did you know that he spoke that in the context of forgiveness? Of how to love folks that don't love you, folks that can't stand you. <laughs> love your enemies, pray for those who spitefully use you. While he's saying that, then he says, be ye perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. What is he saying? I used to read scriptures like that and it always sounded like Jesus was schizophrenic. You're talking about love and everything and all of a sudden you jump off and say, start talking about being perfect. What, what, what? Oh, you like me? At least that's how I was growing up in church. It seemed like these scriptures were randomly thrown out without explanation. Why did he say be ye perfect? Because he was talking about how to perfectly extend love, his agape love to others, to be a vessel that he could speak through, a mature vessel that he could just demonstrate his love through. Isn't that awesome to know? Thank you, Lord. Bless the Lord. Come on, let's just receive this for the Lord. Lord, we thank you, Lord. Lord. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we receive this word. We receive this fresh understanding of what it means to actually be in Christ and for Christ to be in us, for your spirit to be present within us. Thank you, Lord God, for this great and awesome thing that we have that's called salvation. Your grace and your love extended to us Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now I know in a greater way why Jesus said, don't just rejoice that demons are subject to you, but rejoice because your name is written in the book of life. Rejoice that we're saved. I don't ever want our teaching and everything to get so deep and so... Uh, complicated that we can't ever just fall back on this one thing lord i'm just glad that i'm saved the old school saints used to say these words i'm glad to be saved and sanctified and baptized and filled with the holy spirit <laughs> the holy ghost and all i'm doing is just saying it in a different way to a different generation but those same things but this time so that we can have understanding so we're not just mimicking what everybody says People get up and say, I thank the Lord I'm saved and sanctified, baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. No, let's not. God said, let's stop and really think about what we're saying. I thank the Lord that I'm saved. Thank you, Lord. I repented. I believed. I received. I got off a death row. I'm no longer under the penalty of sin. Death no longer has rule over me and I'm sanctified Lord you are removing sin's influence off of my life my emotions my thought process my physical body thank you Lord you're removing it from my children from my grandchildren thank you Lord thank you Lord Thank you, Lord. Lord, I thank you for your promise to use this congregation to bring healing into hearts and homes in this community. Lord, we're small right now, but Lord, I thank you for the hearts of those that you have gathered to us. I thank you, Lord God, for your mighty move your mighty move, your breakthroughs. Thank you, Lord. We're rejoicing today because you saved us. We're rejoicing today because you sanctified us. We're rejoicing today because even glorification is there for the future. Thank you, Lord. We're rejoicing today. And Lord, now I thank you for using this people throughout this week, Lord, on our jobs, at home, in our families. Thank you for using us, Lord, to model, to demonstrate 
your love. Pour through us, Lord God. 